if you had to survive long term in a forest like this one here, could you find enough to eat without the use of things like bows, traps, snares or even fish hooks? That's what we're going to be looking at in this video. It's like halfway between crispy chicken skin and pork crackling. Let's go see what we can find. Here's the first one we've found. This is Kiki. And you can see when you look close that it's absolutely loaded with fruit. It's the 2nd of April today. So these fruit are just getting ripe. Another couple of weeks and they'd be really ripe. But one thing about these fruit is you do have to compete with all the other animals because they love eating them too. So yeah, you can see this one started to get ripe and something's already getting into it. Tui love to eat these, so do possums and rats and just about everything else. You can also eat the flowers on these. They're ready in springtime, we've gone over that in other videos, but yeah, particularly the male flowers, they are really sweet and delicious. But yeah, what we've got today are these fruit, and basically you just take that hard outer layer off and inside there, there's really nice sweet flesh. The taste of the kiki fruit is quite similar to the flower flavor wise. It's sort of a, a fragrant, it's sort of a fragrant fruity taste. Imagine a pear that's got a little bit of perfume on it or something. This particular kiki fruit came up to 10 on the Brix refractor meter, which basically measures sugar content. It's quite low, strawberries come up to about 14, but this isn't a very ripe kiki fruit. I have eaten them a lot sweeter than this one here, so it's probably quite a wide variation depending on how ripe the fruit is. Look for kiki in places that are steep and that have quite a bit of sunlight getting in. Quite often it grows in that first couple hundred metres out of the creek where the terrain's quite steep and there's often a bit of broken bush, not so much canopy. That's the most likely place you're going to see it. This here is prickly mingy mingy. The leaves are quite prickly to touch and it usually has quite a prolific fruiting of these little white berries. But they don't taste very good unfortunately. They're quite dry and they only come up to about four on the bricks meter. They also have these little red or pink berries but they don't taste any better. They still taste really dry. But over here we've got soft mingy mingy which looks quite similar but the leaves are soft to touch and they have these little much smaller almost translucent red berries and they're actually really nice and sweet and they come up to about 11 on the bricks meter so much higher in sugar but unfortunately they're not as prolific. There's quite a few tower trees in here and about a month or two ago there were loads of tawa berries on the ground. They were early this year. Usually there's berries at this time of year. And they're a really good food source because you can get the flesh off them. And you can also get the kernel. It's a bit like potato once you boil it up. But yeah, they're completely gone in this area now. They've rotted away and there's nothing left. So that's a good example of how seasonal some of these foods are. They're here one day and they're gone the next. So in a survival situation, you certainly can't bank on finding particular fruit in the bush. But one thing you can bank on being here all year round are small animals and particularly brush tail possums. And if we can get our hands on some nice fatty possum meat, that's just going to be prime. That'll be all the food we need. If we can reliably get it, we could live out here forever. So yeah, what I'm thinking is we could make some snares we could make some cordage out of natural plant fibres like otaweka or arakiki or kiki and then we could make a snare or a trap of some kind but instead of doing all that work and waiting for the next day to see if we've caught anything we're going to do it the lazy way we're going to get a stick and we're going to see if we can't find ourselves a possum within the next hour or two sweet so this stick will do perfectly it's a limb off this old beech tree here, just a little bit of heartwood that's left in it. In case some of you don't know, possums are nocturnal, so they come out at night. So because we're looking for one during the day, we're looking for one in its den. So we're going to have to be very observant if we want to find a possum during the day. So we're going to be looking for places they're likely to be sleeping in holes. 
underneath trees, underneath logs, and then when we find holes we're looking for wear and tear, see if there's any possum shit around, and also checking to see if there's any spider webs across the holes. That might let us know that there's not a possum in there at the moment. It's not uncommon for possums to use several different dens throughout the week, so just because we find a hole that a possum's been using doesn't mean there's going to be one in there. We're just going to keep cruising and eventually we should find one if we keep looking long enough. Man, there's a really good possum run coming down this ridge here. It's really well smoothed out. We can tell it's possum because there's lots of shit on it and on the side of it. You can see that blackening too on some of the tree roots and some of the moss from the possums rubbing over it constantly. If we were going to set traps or snares or something, this is where we'd want to put them. Now that we've found this possum run, our plan is just to follow it until it leads us back to hopefully a possum den. If we don't find one walking this way, we'll turn around and follow it in the other direction. So we've followed that run for about 150 meters and it's gone back into the big bush now so we're no longer in the scrubby stuff which isn't ideal but we'll keep following it hopefully they're camped out in a hole and not way up in a tree no possums in here there's one in this hole here you can see his nose just in there so he's awake. This is the only exit to the den by the looks, unless it goes further up. The tree, I hope not. So the trick to catching a possum like this is to slowly put your hand in there and get a hold of the tail and then slowly start to pull that tail out. As long as the possum's clawing onto the ground or the tree, which it's naturally going to do, then you're pretty safe. If you do feel the possum's tail go slack and he lets go of whatever he's holding on to, the best thing you can do is quickly give him the end of your stick. That way he'll bite and chew on that rather than chewing on your arm. And then yeah, the first chance you get, you want to give it a quick tap on the head. So the first thing we want to do once we've killed the possum is to pluck it. Pluck all the fur off, that's easiest to do while it's still warm, as it is with most animals. We've also gutted the possum, cut the claws off, and we've also taken the scent glands out, which are at the base of the tail. You want to take those out because they can make the meat taste quite strong. This is the possum's liver, and that bag there is the gallbladder. I usually just pull that off. That's what contains all the bile that the possum uses to break down fats. The liver is an amazing food source. It contains all sorts of stuff, including vitamin B12, vitamin A, B2, B9, iron, copper, zinc, and folate. It's one of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. So, yeah, liver's awesome. Usually the first thing I try and eat off most animals. And this is why possum meat in particular is so valuable in the bush. And that's because they can carry a lot of fat, a lot more than most of the other animals like deer and even wild pigs in the bush. Our bodies are the most efficient at converting fat into our own fat compared to things like carbohydrates and protein. We're going to be leaving the skin on the possum while we cook it. One, just because it's delicious and crispy, but two, and the main reason, is because there's a lot of fat that sits underneath the skin on possums and on most other animals, even fish and birds, they, they usually carry their fat underneath their skin. Humans do the same thing. So yeah, a lot of the time people skin animals, that's sort of a common practice. But if you're really wanting to get the maximum calories out of an animal, you definitely don't want to skin it and throw the skin away. Because even if you skinned it real clean, there's still a lot of fat that sits attached to that skin. So we've got this possum rotisserie set up here. Ideally we'd cook it in a pot or a camp oven or something like that so we could catch all the fat because a lot of that fat's going to drip off into the coals unfortunately 
but we're just making do with what we've got today. So while our possum's cooking, let's go have a look at this little gem of a plant right here. This is called South Heal, or Heal All, and it's highly nutritious. It's got anti-inflammatory properties, it's got antibacterial properties, it can be used to make a pulpus to put on cuts so that they don't get infected and also to speed up the healing process. It's also really high in calcium. It's part of the mint family, but it doesn't taste anything like mint. It's just got a really mild flavor. The leaves are edible. It has these little purple flowers that almost look like lavender flowers. You find it in most clearings in the bush, on the edges of rivers, places like that. This plant here is called kahaka, and it looks very similar to the astelias or the widow makers, but it is a different plant and the berries are quite a bit nicer in my opinion. You often see it growing quite high up on trees. These berries are really really nice, they taste a little bit like jelly. They're very sweet and the bricks test on these came up to 12 so it sort of validates they are quite high in sugar and yeah really really edible, beautiful berries. So back to our rotisserie possum now. It's been cooking on the coals for almost two hours. And look at it, man, it looks delicious. We'll try a bit of this hock first. Oh. So juicy. And pretty tender too, considering it hasn't been hung at all usually. Ideally we'd hang this for a couple of days before we ate it just to make the meat more tender but definitely don't need to. People ask what possum tastes like. Basically it tastes like the best fried chicken you've ever had. Look at that tail and the tail is one of the best parts. Down the back steak, look at that. Look at that. Crispy. It's like halfway between crispy chicken skin and pork crackling. One thing I never go in the bush without is one of these things, a lighter. Because if there's anything that's going to kill you quick in the bush, it's hypothermia or exposure. So if you've got a lighter, you can get a fire lit and you can warm yourself up. Of course you can get a fire going with friction if you know what you're doing. But if you're trying to do it on the fly in the bush, in deep bush, it's often quite damp in here and you're going to have to be able to find the exact right species and it's going to need to be dry which is probably not the scenario you're going to be in if you really need a fire so yeah these things are lifesavers oh well that was a lot of fun i hope you guys enjoyed it as much as i did please don't use these videos as your only source of reference for edible native plants or edible plants overall there's some great field guide books out there uh, one that I've been reading lately is really good, The Lost Book of Herbal Remedies, this one here. It's wicked. And another good one is Andrew Crow's Edible Native Plants. That's a classic, classic book for native edibles. I'll leave an affiliate link for both of those books in the description in case any of you guys want to purchase one of them. But yeah, anyway, thanks heaps for watching. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.